So welcome everybody. This is Hugh Massey, the CEO and founder of DNA Behaviour International. And today I'm delighted to be doing another one of our Identity EQ interviews. And I've got Malcolm Lelever with me from Scoresby, Victoria in Australia. Malcolm and I have known each other for 15 or 16 years now and worked actively together uh, with the DNA behaviour business, also with his uh, current business that he is the founder of and CEO of Brilliant Fit. Uh, Malcolm does a lot of work in career development, leadership development, talent development. He's been passionate about these areas for a long time. So Mal, it's great to be uh, with you uh, this evening for me and this, and this morning for you. So um, what I'd like to do is just ask you the sort of startup question of just, just tell us a little bit about your career journey to date uh, and how, how you've got to this place of uh, uh, working in your passion and purpose with Brilliant Fit. Mm, sure. Thanks, Hugh. Really good to uh, be with you this morning for me. Um, over here, it's nice and early. At, uh, no, happy to do that and happy to be uh, uh, um, part of this uh, process. Look, for me, uh, my journey, I spent uh, probably close to 20 years in corporate life. I had the wonderful opportunity and privilege of, uh, and I do consider it a real privilege of living and working in uh, quite a few different places around the world. Um, and that gives you, I think, uh, a really great perspective and appreciation of different cultures and people uh, and appreciation. Um, I suppose it, more than anything, it really drove a passion and, and a desire in me to truly understand what makes people tick. Um, and I think it was really around kind of uh, at the end of that point that you and I actually met um, and uh, we had that initial kind of connection and I do believe in connections. I think it was uh, our initial meeting was around uh, I had three people in a two-month period or a six-week period or something come to me and say, do you know Hugh Massey? Because uh, all the stuff you're talking about um, he's a kind of expert in it. And uh, I went, no, I've never heard of Hugh Massey. And the second time I heard about it, I went, you know what? Second time in two or three weeks, someone's mentioned someone's name. And I start to take reference of these things. And by the third time, I went, I just need to get on a plane and go and meet you. So that kind of, if you remember that, uh, that, that time when we actually connected and, and I felt our, our kind of paths were aligned in, in different ways of truly understanding what makes people tick. Um, and you've had this brilliant technology that's been around for you know, 20 odd years now. Um, that's been really a core of, of who we are and why we've developed Brilliant Fit. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been a great journey. Uh, it's been a fascinating journey. It's been an incredible uh, uh, self-development journey, if you like you. Um, as you know, when you go on these entrepreneurial journeys, there's a oh, challenge. <laughs> It's been an amazing journey, Mal, and, and you know, we've both developed, but the, the big thing is we've never lost a passion mm. wanting to know how people tick, but also, you know, the caring that goes on with that because, it, mm. you know, our mutual desire to, to see people maximise their potential and make the most of who they are mm. uh, has always been fundamental to that. Uh, for both of us, I think that's mm. at the end of the day, that's uh, that's what kept that's what kept us going um, mm. and developing. But when you when you worked in the corporate career, what was a pivotal mm. moment? Was there a pivotal moment in there that got you to shift from, you know, in a way more of a results based world, if you want to call it that, to dealing with human nature? There were several, but one of them that really comes to mind is um, uh, I was in the middle of selling a company and uh, we had a team of people who were in the process of doing that and uh, a tragedy occurred within a family member of one of the team. Um, and uh, in fact, they, uh, the, this person's uh, uh, child took their life um, in a very tragic way. And we were right in the middle of this kind of really important, intense process uh, of selling a business. Um, and I probably make one of the better decisions in my life. I stumbled over a great decision. 
um, I actually stopped the process in mid-flight and I halted absolutely everything and I simply said, we're going to turn our attention and we're going to support this person um, as a team and uh, probably one of my better leadership decisions that I made. Uh, and I was, you know, relatively young at the time. I was in my kind of early 30s. Um, but it was very pivotal because it absolutely shifted everything. And you talk about that care process. You talk about, uh, you know, me being a pretty results-driven, and I am. I'm, I'm very highly results-driven kind of person naturally. I don't start from a naturally high empathetic position. Um, but that was a, a real choice that, uh, which came from that kind of values base, if you like, that we need to support and care for these people. And so we just um, harnessed the entire team um, to do that. And we stopped the process for four or five days just to support this family. Um, the impact of that decision reverberated through the rest of my life um, because it was the right choice. And because of what we did, just totally changed the perception that people had um, of me as a leader and what I was prepared to do. Because they knew I was very results driven. They knew that all in, in the normal circumstances, that's what made me who I am. Um, but when they saw I actually cared and, when, uh, and what I was prepared to do to support someone, uh, the entire base changed. And I got, and, and they would, you know, they, they did things for me way and above, you know, after that process, they did things for me way and above what I normally would have expected. Um, and so it was a great lesson. I stumbled into that um, decision. Um, it wasn't a super strategic thing at the time going, I need to do this and this. It was, came out of who I was, I suppose my values were driving it. Um, and they overrode that natural kind of, competitive, rational kind of process. And, and I made the right choice around that. And I'm incredibly grateful because uh, it's been long lasting impact of how to actually lead people through crisis, uh, through different scenarios in life. Um, and the importance of carrying that relationship as a leader is so critical. Um, and I think it's just becoming more critical. It's always been there as a really important part but I think it's just becoming so much more critical as people go through lots of pressure and stress um, as their world evolves. I mean, you've just given me massive goosebumps <laughs> as I've heard that. Because to do that, you know, in a way, instinctively mm. uh, or naturally, like you did at that, at that time, as a young leader dealing with that big transaction, uh, mm. took a lot of courage. Uh, mm. But I think what it does bring out as well, Mal, is that if you have the right character and you have the right value set, that will always override the natural behaviour in the sense of the, you know, the DNA way of mm. are you result to relationships. What it brought out was the relationships part of you that's embedded in there um, and... and mm very deeply and the caring because that's what I've always seen from you is the caring has mm. always come out, even though you might think logically about a situation, it's, 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 it's the caring that, 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 that comes out and the caring for the people. Mm. And mm. it's, I think it's what a lot of leaders, uh, what you did is what a lot of leaders don't have the courage to do because they don't trust in that. If you build the relationship, foster it, nurture it, care for the people at some point the result will end up being better yeah but you've got it but you've got to believe in that um that that will come but that's what you did yeah and and, and it's you know, when you do these things and step in you don't know the outcome right um but i've always kind of uh i used to think in that in days gone past that kind of courage was the opposite to fear uh, it's actually not it's simply one step beyond fear. Um, yeah. And you continue to choose to step into a space where you don't know the outcome, but you're trusting and believing that it's going to be better for stepping into that space. Um, and there's huge uncertainty. But when you go out of a characters and values base, it enables you to do that. Fear will always be there um, for me um, and I think for everyone, but it's about stepping beyond it into that kind of space as a leader. But as leaders, you've, you've, you've got to have 
you've got to have that character. Mm, absolutely. And, totally. and, 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 and you've got to then have the courage to make the right decisions um, mm. that come mm. with that, that are based on uh, values and human values. Yeah, it's interesting that. around the, the values piece, it, it kind of prompted something else as you're talking then. One of the other uh, probably quite defining moments for me as a leader was, um, uh, again, I was uh, not too similar time to this. I, um, as a young leader, I was the first to put up my hand around, uh, you know, getting some upward feedback uh, from my team. It was a time when upward feedback had, it was quite new um, in organisational development terms. So I said, I'm, I'm one of those people who I'm kind of an early adopter, if you like, uh, of ideas and concepts. So I said, right, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to nail it, right? And so uh, I engaged in the process. Um, when I got the results back, uh, it took me three days to process them because uh, my first reaction literally was, well, these, aren't, the, these must be the wrong results. So it was quite a, uh, a, a revelation to me that um, what I was doing and what my intentions were, were not aligned to what people were experiencing. So it was yeah. a pretty fundamental shift in understanding other people was to understand yourself. Um, and so, you know, as I say, good intentions don't cut the grass, right? Um, it, it's really about what you do. Uh, and so as part of that process, I got that feedback and I went on this journey about, well, what is it? How do I unlock the people who work for me? How do I truly understand them? And that's going to mean I actually need as a leader to adapt um, because I can't just expect them to operate like I do. So how do I actually unlock them? What are, what, what are the things that are really important to them? What are the drivers for them? What do they do well? How do, I, how do I amplify um, that kind of thing? So I went about a journey of really working hard for the next year and uh, to do that. And I went through the process again thinking, great, I've nailed it. Because, you know, ambition and drive are a natural part of who I am in my talent DNA. Um, and so, uh, you know, in my naivety, I thought, right, 12 months, I'm going to absolutely nail this and it's going to be great. Um, I got the results back and they were really significantly better, right? But they weren't the standard in that top 5 or 10% that I was expecting. And so that then put another kind of filter over me that this actually needs to be a lifelong journey, right? That, you know, if I seriously want to understand what makes people tick and what drives them um, and how do I kind of uh, activate that kind of divine nature within them, Right. I'm actually going to have to go on a journey myself. And so I peeled all that back to try and understand for me and what were my true value set. And one of them was I created a value around being committed to success of other people. Yeah. And I think that really touches on that caring bit that you talked about before. Why do we build brilliant fit? Well, it's all part of activating people's divine nature, but it's about helping them as well truly understand, work with, care for them, help them be the best version of themselves. Um, and that choice around creating that value is why we why I exist today and why Breed Fit exists today. Um, because if I'm committed to your success, how do I do that? And how do I do that at scale? So they're kind of two pivotal moments, if you like, on my leadership journey um, that have certainly shaped me a lot. But I think if I uh, take that, you know, experience you had when you made, you know, doing the transaction and you made the big decision to hold it up for four or five days to effectively care for the family or help the t and also help the team recognise the importance of that family who was going through the tragedy with their son. Mm. That gave you the wake up moment of. You made the courageous decision. You saw a great impact out of it. Um, mm. As you said, it was showing good intention. Mm. But nevertheless, that was really the starting point because good intention was something, but you still had to keep, you had to now learn how to, on a continuous basis, manage your impact on other people mm. as you went mm. forward from there. Mm. And that was the part that then took you more into learning more about your actual self 
of what Absolutely. were the behaviours and how were you, how how were people reacting or responding to Malcolm as the leader, mm. um, and you know what some of the feedback wasn't all that you wanted it to be, uh, mm. but you took it that okay, I, if if I'm going to keep demonstrating, if I'm going to keep demonstrating this good good intention all the time, I need to match it with my behaviour. People need to. Mm. Totally. They need to feel loved. They need to feel empathised with, um, mm. which isn't necessarily, you know, you mean more of a logical, rational per person processing decisions isn't something that comes across. I mean, I know that for myself that, mm. you know, when I started my career it, as an accountant, I was good at the, all the numbers side and I thought I was good at people because I wanted to teach them and educate them. But if they didn't come along quickly enough with me, <laughs> It wasn't much good. So, but just regardless of how good your heart is, if it doesn't demonstrate or it's not demonstrated outwardly in the behaviour, mm. uh, it's a problem. And I think that's what I'm trying to sort of bring out here for for the listeners as well is that you had that big experience with the transaction that turned you around and got you to look at everything. You looked at yourself, and then you've you've gone on the behavioural discovery journey for yourself. Mm -hmm. and seeing the power of it and how many people uh, that you've impacted as a great leader. And now you want to, you want to take with brilliant fit on a scalable basis, get more and more people to, uh, you know, live to their potential to, to shine as human beings, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a very caring way. Yeah. That, I suppose, that's, what, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, certainly, um, uh, when you, as a leader, and you've got teams around you and, and, and those kind of things, you obviously impact that community. Um, so something was burning inside me for many years around how do you, how do, you do that at scale, right? So my training ground was, you know, 20, 25 years of, of uh, working with teams, leadership, that kind of thing, coaching, um, developing, working with you, understanding things, getting much deeper insights. Um, but then the burning passion came through. How do we do this at scale? How do we how do we make a global impact? How do we unlock people, right? Like we've never been able to unlock people before. And that was really for me the essence of why we created Brilliant Fit was to be able to do it at scale. Um, yeah, because that and that's that it, that's bringing the two things together, if you like. So before we get to that specific piece, mm. when 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 you. You know, and you've been part of the uh, a big part of the evolution of DNA behavior. But you know, just around your own style, if you want to call it that, and you know, yeah. in my language, business DNA, but the the, the DNA style, the natural style, mm. and you discovered your own, mm. absolutely, uh, and, and you know, completed the process, discovered your own, and you know, just for our listeners, you, you're you're an initiator pretty similar mm -hmm. to me in a lot of ways. Uh, we've got some differences though. Um, mm -hmm. Extremely fast paced, extremely creative and a risk taker. So what, bringing that together, what does that, what does that meant for you? And, you know, uh, how, how you want to uh, stand out, um, how you've had to adapt. Yeah. Well. Well, if, if I take it from a personal perspective, you, um, uh, it, it's it's the most stark. I married someone who's completely the opposite. Um, so my beautiful wife is uh, very patient, and not fast paced. Uh, she's much more anchored side than the creative side that I am, and she's certainly not a risk taker. So it probably uh, she had a huge wake up call in her first early years of marriage because my traits naturally scared the daylights out of her. Um, but from that perspective, and, and I didn't understand the power of your traits because absolutely what you described is, is totally true. Um, I didn't understand from my fast paced nature that I'm in the top kind of 5% of the population. Um, so 95% of the population are more naturally patient. Um, and that came out um, as I, like my early career. Um, they, you know, a lot of the feedback was you are really, really good commercially. Right? You can understand concepts, you can do things, the creativity you bring and the resources you bring to solving problems is you know, pretty significant. 
Um, and so deal making, um, turning companies around, those kind of things just naturally happen to me and I get a lot of buzz out of it. Um, one of the greatest motivators of um, one of my bosses in my early career stumbled over was he would simply come into my office and sit down and, and start talking about a problem that, you know, as he related to me, was not possible to be solved. <laughs> I don't think there's an answer to this. Um, and what he had learned to do was he realised that he wanted to tap into that resourcefulness and he knew that motivated me. And so I would go away and come back to him in two or three days with a, with a, with a solution. Um, that kind of, when I started reflecting on it, I thought, yeah, these are natural traits. These are things. But I equally realised that while as an individual that can be fantastic and you've got those kind of natural talents to do that thing and to take risks, the other thing was I didn't see myself as a risk taker here. That's the other kind of thing that I've realised over time, even though I'm in the top 10 or 15% for risk taking, it naturally just felt like everyone else. I'm in, I'm the norm. I'm just like everyone else, aren't I? Um, and so it was the reactions from time to time that I got from people that really made me question, think, why are these people actually just getting on board here? And they're going, whoa, have you considered all the risks? Uh -huh. Um, and so all these things played out in many different ways. And in yep. the early days, I didn't understand because I didn't have the insights of DNA. Um, but I started to put these different things together and the feedback kept coming back, guys, you're really great commercially, right? But we really want to work on your people skills, right? Because at times you come across too direct, too challenging, and you ask too many questions that make people feel uncomfortable. And so... Uh, that was uh, that was a real kind of pivotal moment, if you like, when you get more and more of this feedback coming in. You go, well, how do people see me? Right? Let's let's get some. And to me, you know, having the evidence is actually quite important. And the evidence can be anecdotal. It, it, it can obviously be survey based as well. Um, but it's what you do with that feedback that's actually critical. Um, and. So I actually, that's, you know, part of where that journey began um, to make those changes. And, you know, definitely for me in knowing you, I've seen your ability to solve problems um, is outstanding to see solutions that are way ahead of uh, anybody else ever seeing them. Um, you know, to being able to package something up uh, mm. and it be, and it be logically uh, driven uh, you know, the, all of those things are there. But I've also seen, you know, as we've talked about so far today, Mal, the caring side of it. Mm. You know? But I think mm. that's where it's making sense to me that in taking, you know, if you want to call it those uh, more commercial uh, type talents, mm. uh, of being a visionary, uh, implementing things because i think that's something that you're you're very you're very strong at you know taking it and reducing it down to a gantt chart and getting the timing right and 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 following all the steps with something new you 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 can do all that but something doing something that involves people and their development with the caring because of that coming a lot from your values is mm. something that's very unique um and then wanting to do it at scale I mean, hmm. I think anybody with your talents is going to want to do it at scale. Um, yeah. yeah, no, you're just keeping them to yourself. <laughs> no, but I mean, you've got a choice. Do you do this one-on-one -on -one with a group of people hmm. and, um, you know, sort of run it like a, a brain surgeon's practice with, you know, you and three assistants, or do you uh, giving them great insights and great, you know, problem solving and charge out at a thousand bucks an hour for your wisdom? Hmm. Uh, or do you go and... Um, take this on at scale and, and get more leaders out there in the world and, you know, young people mm. learning your courage, but also how to show it out properly to influence people. Cause I think that's what you're, that's what you're doing. Um, yeah. And want to do. So if, if we take those talents, Mal, you know, and, and sort of this idea I, or I have around identity and, you know, you're, your greatest strategic impact in the world. What would mm. you what would you peg that as? 
Well, certainly, again, it goes back to probably what drives me, and that's that kind of inner self. I, I have a, a strong faith myself, yeah. and a part of that is a core driver that I believe that everyone on this planet has a purpose um, and has a contribution to make. And so coming from that base, um, I, I very much believe in, in what I see as my natural assignment now is how do I activate that kind of divine nature in, within people? How do I help uh, every individual be the best version of themselves? How do I help do that at scale? And so those were kind of the essence of what drives me um, around accepting my own identity and accepting all of those things because I had to go through a journey on that, Hugh. There's a lot of things when I was growing up um, that I didn't like about myself um, and that I actually, actually hated at one stage um, because I just think these, these things aren't helping. These things, I wish I was different. And it took me quite a long time to realise that I have these traits. They're unique, right? Yeah. Um, and, and probably for the world's sake, there's not too many Malcolms around, right? But at the same token, you, 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 you are here. You've, you've got talents that are for a purpose, for a season. Um, here at this point in time in history, um, we've got technology developing. We've got all these other things developing. You know, if I was born 100 years ago, um, none of this conversation would be happening. Right? We wouldn't be able to do it at scale. Um, and so I think, you know, this timing and all of that, we're here for a purpose and part of that is aligning for me um, around that. Um, how, do I, how do I do that? How do I fulfil what I'm actually on this planet to do? And I think timing is, you're right, timing with technology is played into our hands. You know, the technology has been evolving or technologies have been evolving over the last 20 years or really even before that, but they've accelerated but to be able to do something like what you're talking about to help people, um, you know, activate their divine nature at a, at scale, literally at scale, thousands, millions of people, because that's really mm. what you're thinking is, mm. how do I do this with millions of people globally? Mm. Uh, you've done the learning about behaviour, yes. but now activating that using technology mm. brings, but bring. To do that, you've got to have the uh, the innovation skills that you have mm -hmm. yeah. and the logic ability to piece it all together, uh, the commercial experience that you've had, you know, from going way back past 20 years doing doing these big transactions. Mm -hmm. you are, and, and the real-life experiences as well of dealing with people in, in, in all sorts of situations. You can't mm -hmm. just – you just can't wake up and build a system – to do this um, no it, it i felt it was a combination of 30 years and i felt it was a combination of even doing the behavioral stuff that we did for many years and doing the one-to-ones and the team and all those it's packaging all of that experience together um and it's the uniqueness of the timing it's the uniqueness of where technology comes into play um it's that entrepreneurial drive to push against you know, the impossible barriers. Um, you know, we've done stuff recently where um, even in creating a whole uh, video content library that wasn't there before, right? The way we've done it, just no one else had done it out there. Um, and it was to solve problems and to do those kind of things. So I've been incredibly grateful for the people that I've had around you. Also, your support, Hugh, um, you know, you're the, the king of the, the behavioural insights, if you like, um, and just, you know, your openness and I think that that relationship that, that we developed maybe 17 years ago or whenever it was, um, you know, that connection point, uh, I think it was based on character um, to start with. I did um, want to say that at the beginning of the call, but I think that's a great uh, uh, place to be at right now. It's, it's about character. Um, mm. And... You know, you've always demonstrated it through everything, even when you've, you know, had some knocks. You've always made the right decisions. I think, Mal, you know, in dealing with people, that was, that's not just around me, but that's with, with many others. Mm. Um, I think I've been fortunate to see Lee Ellis do the same thing, you know, mm. to have two great people uh, in my life that uh, to watch, make, 
courage, you know, character-based decisions with a lot of courage. Mm. Mm. It's fantastic. And that's why, you know, Lee has been in my life for 20 years. You've been in my life, you know, coming on for 20 years. And there's a couple of other people, mm. you know, for similar reasons. And, and I think at the end of the day, that's what, that's a big lesson anybody listening to this today should learn is character and values trump everything else. Mm. But mm. the behaviour with the right use of them, with the right purpose can take you a long way. Um, and I think Correct. technology today that exists and you're able, you've got the smarts to capitalise on how to create thousands of videos to make the uh, behavioural experience dynamic so people mm. will live and feel it, mm. not just read it on a sheet of paper or on a computer in a dashboard, mm. Mm. is brilliant. And, that, and that's, what's going to make, that's what's going to make a huge difference. Uh, for a lot of people because they'll they, they will but they will ex through those videos they'll experience your caring and that mm. and that's why i'm not doing videos in that same way because i can't demonstrate i i care <laughs> and you know that but i, mm, I can't absolutely. demonstrate caring in the way that you do and and the support of jared that you have mm. and i think that's going to be that's going to be the winning touch with this yeah it's a it's a <laughs> It, it, those kind of things and those development have to come from a very strong character base and a very strong values base. Um, and it is driven very much out of my, you know, that, that value that I created being, I'm committed to other people's success. So what does that mean? What does that mean in a situation where I've got to run into a difficulty with someone? If I'm committed to their success, what does that actually look like? How do I need to adapt? How do I need to work with that? Um, uh, to do it and it's it's been foundational um, and it's helped us push through a lot of things but i also think just as we conclude up here mal the videos mm. are going to be a live way a relatively live way that you can show you're committed to every team's success even if you haven't met all the people yeah they're, absolutely they're, they're going to feel your presence mm. in those videos and that you care for them and then they need to demonstrate that caring with their colleagues uh, and, and the others in their life that, that are experiencing, you know, the, 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 the DNA discovery and, and their own leadership experience and what, and what courageous decision they need to make. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's, where, that's where really the videos are going to be a game changer in that sense. Because it's not just the video of saying, okay, this is your trait. It's the caring mm. that comes inside, that comes with it. Yeah. And, and, and one, one of the things that I think that we, I suppose it's captured in the phrase, how do we learn to honour the people around us for who they are and what they bring without stumbling over who they're not? Yeah. And that kind of is a framing, if you like, the way we put these videos together, the way we put the team insights together, the leader insight, those kind of things. It's, it's how do we honour people for what they're bringing to any scenario, any context, both as an individual, as a team member, and maybe as a leader. Um, how do we honour them for that without stumbling over their weaknesses or their challenges or their struggles in different ways? And that's the caring aspect, I suppose, uh, Hugh, that you're talking about there. And, yeah, and um, you'll be able to bring that out in the video because it can't come out on paper. No, no, it can't. And it can't, come out, in the te it can't come out in technology itself. But, you know, as we're all learning, technology is the enabler. And, yeah, absolutely. And it's going to enable you to put the human touch on this for thousands, millions of people. So, you know, Mal, I'm really glad for you that you've worked out how to do it, uh, to activate this, to... Uh, um, you know, develop and nurture so, so many people and you're going to do multiples in the future. So this is, this is fantastic. Mm, thanks, Hugh. No, I really appreciate that uh, support and encouragement. Um, we've come on a, a journey the last 20 years and hopefully we've got another uh, good 20 years or more in front of us. To, uh... Well, you've inspired me to go even further on, 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 on my part of this. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we're going to be doing... Um, you know, many great things yet together, uh, and, and it'll mm. be great to see you in person when we both can travel. Um, Indeed. But, but it's been great spending time with you today, Mel. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank, thanks, Hugh. Really appreciate the opportunity, and uh, all the very best uh, uh, in the US. Mm.